because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. Larry Pratt's latest book is now available on the firing line. Essays in the Defense of Liberty can be purchased from Gun Owners of America for only $18 plus shipping and handling. On the Firing Line is a collection of essays that GOA's Executive Director Larry Pratt has written over the last few years. They were composed in the battle to defend the right to keep and bear arms as well as the rest of our liberties protected in the Bill of Rights. Pratt has taken on the arguments used by the enemies of freedom who would disarm and subjugate Americans. Pratt shows that the debate transcends firearms because the debate is really about control. Who will control the lives of private citizens? Will it be each person individually or will it be the government? You can order your copy of On the Firing Line by going to the GOA website at gunowners.org or you can call GOA's toll-free number one 888 Guns. That's 888-886-GUNS. This is the Gun Owners News Hour with the latest news about threats to your liberty and your right to keep and bear arms. Our host is Larry Pratt, Executive Director of Gun Owners of America. Our guests include elected and other public officials, journalists, citizen activists, and others who are fighting for the Bill of Rights, especially the Second Amendment. The Gun Owners News Hour covers a broad range of constitutional issues. Remember, the issue is not just about gun control, it's about control. Now, here's your host, Larry Pratt. And welcome to this edition of the News Hour, the Gun Owners News Hour. Today is going to be speaking with Bob Knight. Robert Knight is a good friend of mine and of gun owners generally and of gun owners of America. Um, he has collaborated in a book called Ten Truths About Socialism, which was published by Coral Ridge Ministries a few years ago, still available online thanks to the magic of the Internet. Ten Truths About Socialism is available for your children and your grandchildren. And you might take a peek at it yourself because it is one of the best little primers. And I emphasize little. It's not going to intimidate uh, the now generation that's uh, very much attuned to the videos and the YouTubes and whatnot. The ten chapters are easily digestible. And do they pack a punch? Extremely well organized. Uh, Bob, for a little book, I can't imagine how much time you all must have spent putting that together. It was a collaborative effort, Larry, uh, with uh, co-authors from Coral Ridge Ministries. It came out in 2010, and it's just as vital now as it was then. And we did shoot for clarity. Uh, you know, there's, there, there are no unnecessary words in it. It, it is <laughs> loaded with facts, and it, it gives the history of socialism, why it impoverishes nations, uh, why it leads to tyranny and refugees. And, and it does so without a lot of rhetoric. It just gives the facts. Uh, which is, I think, one of the powerful parts of the book. I remember many, many years ago, I was working in Indianapolis with the International, uh, the uh, Intercollegiate Studies Institute. I was arranging for conservative speakers to go to college campuses in the Midwest, the region that I was entrusted with. And just down the street was then editor of the Indianapolis Daily News, uh, Stan M. Stanton Evans, and I would write an occasional column for him, and he would X out some of my hotter rhetoric and say, you got the facts. That's all you need to outrage people with. You will outrage much more with just the facts. And I think you have written a book that once again shows the wisdom of what Stan Evans was teaching me, that just laying out the facts, and it's documented six ways from Sunday, that little book uh, has more footnotes than a lot of books, many times its size. The Ten Truths About Socialism is one handy book for dealing with, well, among other things, the rhetoric coming out of the White House these days. And all too many Republicans, as well as, of course, Democrats. Bob Knight is the one of the collaborators of the little book, Ten Truths About Socialism. And it really is something that needs to be in the hands of really any American. But certainly uh, it's something we can work with with our children and our grandchildren. Uh, this is something that they're, certainly if they're going to a government school, and even if maybe they're in a lot of 
Christian schools, these are things that don't really get dealt with the way they should. There's a lot of loosey-goosey history going on in our schools these days. And uh, Bob Knight and uh, company really smoked out some of the uh, cobwebs. And, uh, uh, Bob, I just can't uh, thank you enough for the job that you all did when you put together the 10 Truths About Socialism. Now, this is not a partisan book. The, the, The book starts off talking about George Bush abandoning free market principles, quote, to save the free market. Um, that's the kind of logic you would expect of a government school graduate. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the problem with the government schools. They're, they're teaching dependency more than anything else. Uh, they're making the government out to be the hero of everyone. Uh, they deny the truth about America's heritage, uh, which is a, as a Judeo-Christian country. Uh, the founders of our country started with two concepts. One, uh, we are of inestimable value because we're created in the image of God. That's every human being. Two, we're sinners. Uh, We all uh, have problems. Uh, So nobody should be entrusted to have too much power. That's why they devised this ingenious system of checks and balances uh, between the various uh, parts of the federal government and between the states and the federal government. But over the years, the federal government has just grown over and over and over and gotten bigger and bigger and created its own... uh, need for dependency uh, by at the expense of families, churches, small communities. Uh, Edmund Burke called them the little platoons of civilization. The state has become hostile to those little platoons and sees the arrangement uh, that the state would prefer being the individual and the state, nothing in between. That's why when the president of the United States called for universal preschool uh, registration in the, his State of the Union address. If you think about it for a minute, uh, it's the the state saying we want your kids even earlier than we've got them now. Uh, and universal means them, even before they're in kindergarten. Universal also means no, no. Put away those notions of homeschooling or private school. We are going to take care of you. That's right. We'll determine what's taught, what's suitable. Uh, what would be considered uh, real education as opposed to what parents might prefer for their children. It, so really, even if it, even if you're in a county or even a state where there's a lot of pushback going on against federal uh, intrusion, certainly the feds have no legitimate authority constitutionally at all in the field of education. So say you're living in the state of Wyoming or some other state. I, I know I heard the Secretary of Education from the state of Wyoming Sound like she was about ready to mount up and ride to Washington with a pitchfork. Uh, that wouldn't be possible under this universal plan that the president was articulating. Yeah, this has been a dream of early childhood advocates for years, ever since Head Start came on the scene. And uh, Larry, back when I was with Heritage Foundation in the 1990s, I wrote a paper for Heritage, a backgrounder, on Head Start. And I looked at all the research I could, and I found out that the program was being uh, justified and got increased funding every year based solely on a study of the Perry Point Preschool in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, This program that had very little resemblance to a typical Head Start program, and yet over and over lawmakers would say, well, research shows Head Start works. Head Start came out with a comprehensive study years later, and it and it. And they and they just did so again very recently this year, and it shows that the effects of Head Start disappear by the third grade. So what kind of phony doing? science occurs throughout the social sciences? Uh, there's yeah. a an oft repeated uh, figure that something like forty percent of gun sales don't go through a background check. How do we know? Well, two hundred and twenty one people back in the nineties were surveyed. Uh, actually in the 80s, and that's when they discovered that uh, it would have been in the 90s. I take that back because it was after the beginning of the of the background check, and uh, 40% don't go through the background check. Well, 221 people is not a representative sample in any way of the United States. you got to start minimum 1,000. And so, yes, uh, we at Gun Owners of America are a little familiar with junk science, and uh, Head Start is just a part and parcel of that, joined at the hip. My guest today is Robert Knight. He is uh, one of the collaborators of a book, one of the authors of a book called The Ten Truths About Socialism. 
And before we get back to the book itself, I wanted to just follow up a little bit on the point I was making about the junk science that has uh, polluted the gun debate. The uh, the idea, uh, I didn't want to give the idea that Gun Owners of America supports in any which way the instant background check. I was just pointing out that some 40% figure that was pulled out of the air, really, by a phony survey to uh, point out the loopholes uh, uh, supposedly justifying m- making even worse the instant background check system that we have. I'll get right back to the 10 truths about socialism, but let me just briefly say the reason we've opposed it from the get-go, it's unconstitutional to put a prior restraint on the exercise of a constitutional liberty. We don't gag people when they go into a theater, but we do tell them if you holler fire and there's no fire, we're going to penalize you, probably put you in jail. Same thing about carrying a gun. We shouldn't be told whether we can or cannot carry a gun, but we should expect to be penalized if we use the gun in a harmful fashion. Uh, So that's what we're talking about. The instant background check was actually found by a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is not an adjunct of gun owners of America, au contraire, that the instant background check had no impact on crime. So we're talking about something that is useful only for the government to get a universal registry of who has what guns in the country. So enough for the junk science that has bothered gun owners. Let's go back and talk about the 10 truths about socialism. We're actually talking about uh, Kiss and Cousins uh, because it's all of the same world view that somehow the government knows better than me and thee. And as I said at the very beginning of our discussion with Bob Knight, this is not a partisan problem. Bob, as you know, your book starts out talking about how Bush abandoned free market principles And especially, should we note, because he's finally getting some uh, long belated attention as a non-conservative, Karl Rove. It was Karl Rove that expanded Medicare to prescription drug coverage under Bush and called it a conservative measure when it in no such way was. Karl Rove has been at the scene of so many Republican crimes that one begins to think he's not just taking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, he he obviously is not a conservative, Larry. Uh, he brands himself that way, and it, it must fool a lot of people because they keep paying Karl Rove and uh, other consultants uh, huge wads of money uh, to lead them into losing races. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he, he's gone to war against the Tea Party. And, and defenders of the Tea Party like Brent Bozell. And, Even though uh, it was the Tea Party that gave the Republicans their edge after the 2010 elections. Well, and, and, and it was the Tea Party that also elected three uh, very conservative senators, uh, U.S. senators, uh, and... Over the opposition. And, <laughs> and those senators yeah. were elected over the opposition of Karl Rove. That's right, and uh, something like nine out of the ten candidates were moderates that Rove backed all lost. So, you know, he, he's uh, trying to recover from that, and what he's doing is uh, applying the principle that the best defense is a good offense. So he's trying to turn the spotlight on the Tea Parties and blame them uh, for the for the election of Barack Obama when his, his project, Orca, which was supposed to turn out the vote, failed miserably. Orca uh, is a whale, really of course. That's of- it out. Yeah, orca is a, a whale, of course, and that orca died on the beach. Yeah, it got beached. <laughs> hey, by the way, Larry, speaking of junk science, uh, I did a column for the Washington Times uh, back in January uh, 29th, and I mentioned, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, the article by Arthur Kellerman in the New England Journal of Medicine. Yes. In 1993. A gun in the home increases the risk of homicide 2.7 times. He had to abandon that. He came out with a later study that said, well, uh, actually 2.7 was his latest claim. He used to claim that it was 43 times. 43, absolutely. Right, and you don't hear about all the times guns were used to defend homeowners. No, and Uh, the 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 reason Kellerman... Misleading. Kellerman gets around that by definitions, and that's why words are so important. He defined a self-defense use of a gun as killing the home invader, killing the assailant. Well, excuse me, what Clinton's Justice Department found is that over 4,000 times each day, 
an American uses a gun almost always without firing it to chase away, to scare away, to stop an attack on himself or someone near and dear. That's the reality of it. Guns have a huge social utility, which can be evaporated if you define self-defense as killing the bad guy. Yeah, that, this is. Uh, we could do the whole show just on junk science, Larry. Uh, Absolutely, of all kinds. Uh, voting, voting. Uh, look, look at the. They keep claiming that twenty-five percent of minorities lack of a valid photo ID. So how do they dry uh, and buy booze? You know? How do they do anything? How do they cash right. a check? How do they? Right. Uh, you know, uh, this this came from a single junk science study by the left wing Brennan Center, which is funded by George Soros at New York University. It was less than a thousand people. And as you have said, you need at least a thousand for a valid study, and it was a it was full of loaded questions that that skewed the results. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't pass the common sense test. You know, you look around in our society. Do you really think uh, one out of every four people who's a minority walking around doesn't even have a photo ID of any kind? That's it's, just impossible. It's, uh, it's impossible, and yet the media just go ahead and parrot hey, this. Bob, why? Even illegal aliens have IDs. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, they get uh, driver's licenses, they get student ID cards, there are all kinds of IDs out there. And yet, they're telling us with ID. a straight face, 25% don't have IDs? Yeah, right. In their dreams. Yeah, <laughs> talking with Bob Knight. Journal this week to that effect. We're talking about, uh, mostly, uh, we're talking about his book, The Ten, the Ten Truths About Socialism. We're going to return to some of those and uh, deal with them and put them into the current context. So please don't go away. Bob Knight is one of the authors of The Ten Truths About Socialism. And early on in the book, there's a discussion of the growth of socialism in terms of socializing the economy under Bush with TARP between existing socialist programs and what the bailout did, the economy was driven easily nearly to 30% having been socialized. Along comes his immediate successor because the, uh, the bailout was right at the end of Bush's tenure. Obama comes in and within two years has put a lock on for now, Lord willing, we'll undo it yet, uh, the health system, which really takes us up to about half, 50 percent, 0.5 of our economy being a Karl Marx dream, socialized, under control of the savants, the knowledgeable ones, the ones who know so much better than we. We're on the road to serfdom, as a, a famous economic philosopher wrote several decades ago. He was talking about other countries then, but his book might as well have been written to us today in the United States of America. Yeah, that was Hayek, a uh, great writer and uh, economist. And, uh, you know, this, if you don't think socialism affects us, just look at the price of the gas pump. Uh, under President Obama, uh, new oil leases have virtually been shut down on federal land. Uh, that's another reason not to expand federal ownership of uh, wild lands out there. Much of the West is owned by the federal government, and uh, this is strangling economies out west, and by the way, strangling that, energy supplies. That ownership was done by deceit because the Western states were promised entry into the Union on an equal footing basis the way other states had come in. Well, the Eastern states and the Midwestern states had come in with l uh, hardly any land being in the hands of the federales. But out west, with all the territorial land ownership, we never divested the feds of that land, and that's why the percentage of federal land ownership in the west is way over 50%. In some states, it's pushing over 90%. So this is really something that has to be addressed, and it's why, as you just said, uh, it's so difficult for oil to be drilled because a lot of the oil is under lands that are unconstitutionally and deceitfully owned by the federal government. Yeah, and speaking of deceit, President Obama boasts that oil production in the U.S. now is at an all-time high, and that's because of production on private land. It's no thanks to him, right. uh, because he has been discouraging production on federal lands. Uh, so he's taking credit for something that didn't even happen under his administration. 
Uh, this it's is just typical it, of socialists. Uh, exactly. They, yeah, they, it's, they take it, credit for what they haven't done, and they blame others for things they have done. Yeah, exactly. If it weren't for the private drilling lands in North Dakota and the fracking uh, 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 that's allowed in Pennsylvania, uh, it's interesting. There's a I forget the name of the uh, the, the deposit for the uh, shale oil that they're fracking. But in Pennsylvania, they're going great guns and getting lots of oil out of that. Well, that deposit extends into New York State, socialist New York State, and the extraction stops at the state line. It, 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 you know, folks, elections have consequences. Pennsylvania yeah, has do. a tolerably right-of-center governor. They're extracting oil. They're fracking it in, West, in eastern Pennsylvania. Western New York, they got a socialist governor there. Nothing, not a drop. Yeah, and, and speaking of New York, they now have the most restrictive gun law in the nation. Yeah. And uh organization I work for, the American Civil Rights Union, filed a brief on February 11th uh, challenging that law and a ruling upholding it. Good for uh, you guys. Well, the, the Second Circuit Court upheld a district court ruling uh, that said that the law limits the ownership of a gun to someone's home. Meaning you can't you can't take it outside you can't you can't do anything with it except in the home and they cite the Heller case in the District of Columbia and McDonald versus City of Chicago uh, Heller was in 2008 McDonald was 2010 neither of those cases limited the use of guns to the home all the, so the, the worst is, part about those cases was it left it on the table but you're quite right it didn't do any such thing as limit. Yeah, it didn't. And uh, the the brief that was written by Peter Ferrara, it's a brilliant brief. It, he says, that, furthermore, the New York law doesn't pass the rational basis test uh, for a law. He says, any analysis of New York's restrictive handgun policy, denying handgun licenses to average law-abiding citizens, has to start with this undeniable proposition. Neither the state nor the local governments of New York even have the power to deny handguns to criminals. The gangs of New York do not obey current gun control laws, and neither does anyone else who's violently breaking the law. Law, criminals aren't going to even apply for handgun licenses. All that New York's governments even have the power to do is deny handguns to law-abiding victims of criminals. Is that rational, to disarm the victims but not the criminals? Good question. Um, that is an extremely good question, and uh, he's using a standard of uh, analysis for the courts that they invented. It's not a proper analysis. Actually, the standard of review for guns, certainly, if not for everything else, uh, is shall not be infringed. The Second Amendment comes yeah. with its own standard of review. <laughs> Does right. this infringe my gun ownership rights? Well, then that law falls. Yeah, and, and getting back to the book, Larry, uh, socialists have long been against private gun ownership for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. Uh, they, they want all power invested in the state. And if people uh, have guns, that makes them somewhat autonomous. Uh, it means the government doesn't hold all power. So and it means an instinctive hostility toward private gun ownership. It means we don't have to depend on the government for our own protection, which we can't anyway because they can't protect us. And it also means, as you're saying, uh, you guys get out of line and uh, we'll point them at a crook with a badge just as soon as we'll point it at a crook without a badge because that's what well, the Second it, Amendment's all about. Yeah, it's supposed to give public officials pause that maybe they shouldn't trample people's individual rights um and you know i'm not saying that <laughs> public officials should be threatened uh you know i'm not saying that um, but that ought to be in the back of their mind that if they take on dictatorial powers there may be people willing to resist them <laughs> especially if there are enough of us that have escaped the indoctrination of the government schools who understand what the purpose of the second amendment is which deals with our employees <laughs> in various levels of government the second amendment is written for you guys <laughs> yeah one of the one of the things I, I i like very much about the book i like really i like the whole book but you happen to pick up and discuss envy i think that is one of the strongest engines for taking us to a socialist republic a socialist government it's a it's a very powerful and destructive human emotion we can all suffer from it because we're all sons of adam and eve uh, but this is exploited to a fairly well by the marxists why don't you 
explain a little bit of the discussion that you all had in, in the Ten Truths about Socialism. Well, we, we talk about envy being one of the seven deadly sins, and, uh, and it certainly is. And it is the driving force behind socialism, because envy says, if I don't have something, it's somebody else's fault. And if you have it and I don't, I have the right to take it away from you. Of course, I can't do that uh, individually, so I'm going to have the government do it. And socialism has, and so, so governments based on socialism stoke the fires of envy. I, I think the current uh, government we have now has, has become par excellent at stoking the fires of envy. Uh, Barack Obama uses every occasion he can to talk about the rich and their their jets, and he you, you he, didn't he's make very that language. Yeah, you didn't make that. Yeah, and then and then de, and then he uh, talks down individual entrepreneurial uh, ownership and and working for oneself and and building companies and all that because uh, he wants people to think that wealth comes from government, which it does not. Uh, government can ensure the conditions for the creation of wealth by ensuring peace and justice. And that's that's the role of government. That's the God given role of government. Anything and by the way, that, the government's stepping out too far. Justice. Uh, let's distinguish between justice, which uh, uh, goes a long way to making sure we keep our word in a contract. That's justice. Whereas when we see, as you point out in the book, if you see the word social before the word justice, get on your running shoes. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of kids today are buying into that. They think it means compassion. It means helping the poor. It means uh, helping the downtrodden and the and the poor kid who's different and so forth. It's very powerful. Uh, but you're right, Larry. If you see that term, uh, it's leftist code. So we need to be very uh, conscious that when we listen to Obama, we're listening to a man stoke the fires of envy to build that Alinskyite resentment against the targeted enemy. Enemy. They talk about enemies. You and I, folks, are the enemy. Bob, you brought up something in the book that uh, ought to give us all pause. Anybody that's uh, inclined to... Well, you know, there really ought to be some social justice. There are a lot of inequalities in the world, and there's, uh, you know, stuff happens, and uh, we need the government to uh, help spread things around and make things better, as if the government somehow is endowed with more intelligence and compassion than anybody in that grubby, greedy private sector. And so here we've got a guy uh, operating as just about the next Castro of the Americas, Hugo Chavez, who uh, has taken over an oil-rich country, a country which supplies quite a bit of oil uh, to the world. It's blessed with huge deposits, and oil production has gone down under Socialista Chavez. <laughs> Well, you know, Larry, it's not only oil production. Venezuela had a thriving coffee industry uh, until Chavez socialized much of it. Uh, and now Venezuela has to import coffee for the use of its own people instead of exporting it. Uh, because <laughs> once you socialize hmm. something, you, you create shortages automatically. And it's for sure they're not, imp of. they're not importing it from Cuba, another socialist uh, marvel. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, let's go back to oil for a minute. Oil production in Venezuela was uh, 3.2 million barrels a day in 1998 when Hugo Chavez came to power, and then it and it came it went down immediately, uh, and it declined to 2.4 million barrels a day by 2008. So over over that's that a good decade, third. They lost uh, ten, uh, at least a million barrels a day of oil. Right. Um, and what he does is... He and how long did it take to, him to work that marvel? How long? It, it took him a decade. Wow. It, it began immediately, but, you know, when you think about it, it took a long time to build up that oil industry in Venezuela. Right. Uh, then he nationalized uh, the oil fields. He seized them from Chevron and other American companies that were operating there and managed to make sure that they operated inefficiently. I mean, And one of the things that will happen is... They, they don't make proper repairs. Nobody cares. You just keep pumping yeah. until it stops pumping, and then, oh, well, stuff happens. Yeah, yeah, and the only and one reason he's gotten away with this is he's shut down the private press, 
in Venezuela. Uh, he has shut down over 30 privately owned radio stations. He seized control of the main television stations. Uh, when they had a presidential election, uh, they ran uh, speeches by Chavez around the clock, some of which went two and three hours, and they allowed the opposition five-minute responses. Actually, I mean, this- that might have been a blessing in disguise, and it's why the guy probably actually won the election, because you can say what you need to say if you really have to. It takes a lot of work, but you can say it in five minutes. And I'll be doggone if I'm going to listen to any pompous politician. I speak Spanish. I'm not going to listen to it in Spanish or in English. For three hours, forget about it. Yeah, I feel sorry for the Venezuelan people. Uh, I'm sure in, in government offices they're all forced to sit around and listen to the grand leader. Yeah, at least uh, at home you got an off switch. <laughs> that's true. You, you, you know, go play soccer or something. But uh, <laughs> right. You know, but but if you look in this little book we wrote, Ten Truths About Socialism, we look around the world and you cannot find a country thriving under socialism. If you, if you think you have, then it has a strong foundation of capitalism underneath it. I mean, you look and, at the Scandinavian countries. Thank you. Yeah. They have all sorts of problems uh, with uh, – they call it the Monday disease because the, <laughs> the workers don't come in on Mondays or Fridays. Uh, and yet, uh, because of engineering – and uh, homogeneous population, and the residue of a Christian civilization, uh, the Scandinavian com- com- countries are still doing okay, but marriage is collapsing. Uh, the, the socialist dream of all children being brought up the state by the state is getting closer and closer. Uh, and their standard of living, forever. their standard of living, as you point out in the book, has gone from what something like Sweden was fourth highest standard of living in the world, and now they're... 14th or whatever you found, uh, yep. quite a decline. It's declining. They're, they're still chugging along. And uh, it's like, it's as in America, it, it's as if we are living off the inheritance we have. We're ungrateful heirs to the great legacy that our founders gave us of free enterprise, a uh, God-based moral system. Uh, this is what fueled capitalism. It fueled the greatest uh, burst of freedom and productivity in history. And now we're thinking, well, we don't need any of that anymore. The government will do it all for us. And uh, we're finding out with the high unemployment and all the other bad economic indicators, uh, that just ain't the case. Yeah, all you have to do is change a preposition. They won't do it all for us. They'll do it all to us. You got it. As as Ronald Reagan said, the most frightening words in the English language are, I'm, hi, I'm here from the, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. That's right. At which point it's, oh, no. Uh, Yeah. Hey, Winston Churchill had a wonderful quote about socialism and said, the inherent vice of capitalism is the uneven division of blessings, while the inherent virtue of socialism is the equal division of misery. Yeah. And that's the yeah. result of envy. If you, if I can't have it, by golly, you're not going to have it either. And so envy tears down. That's what Obama is doing. He's tearing down. And yeah. the, the pity is that there are capitalists who do just what Lenin said they would do. They will sell the rope for their own hanging. And so you've got Wall Street investment firms giving megabucks to Obama even as he prepares to destroy them. Yeah, it's protection money. Look at it that way. And, and the protection you know, doesn't last very long. No, it doesn't unless you keep pumping it out. I mean, they, they, they always want more uh, for whatever. I mean, Obama has an ongoing campaign. His organizing for America has morphed into an ongoing campaign to destroy his opposition. Uh, it's clear that's what he wants to do, create a single-party state, uh, it's that bad, uh, you know, and I normally I try not to resort to hyperbole and let the facts speak for themselves, but every action he takes is, is to de- demonize his foes and, and acquire more p- government power for himself. And it, uh, if you can find something he's done that hasn't smacked to that, let me know. Now, um, one of the things that you point out that socialism does produce lots of is refugees. Now, a lot of those refugees, not all, of course, but many of the refugees from all over the world have come to the United States because this was the land of the free, and this was where they knew they at least had a shot, and some poobah somewhere wasn't going to pull the rug out from under them nearly as likely as where they came from. 
So they came to the United States, and they've helped make this a great country. In fact, I would wager that those who have come from horrible government-run countries such as Cuba are probably among our most freedom-oriented citizens because they or their parents or their grandparents saw it with their own eyes and have taught it to their children and their grandchildren. But the rest of us have been here longer, didn't come from the same uh, drastic kind of background, and so we're kind of getting sloppy, and we're not pushing back the way we should be. And where do we go if the great American experiment finally collapses someday? Yeah, maybe you can go to Costa Rica, Panama, maybe. Those are very small countries. They're not going to be able to absorb the number of refugees that you totaled up in the 10 Truths About Socialism, Bob. Millions of people have fled socialism. We're not going to find millions of births in Panama and Costa Rica if uh, it goes down here in the United States. Folks, get a copy of the 10 Truths of so- About Socialism. It's a book that your family really needs to read and take to heart. Bob Knight, thanks so much for helping put that book together. Oh, thank you, Larry, for having me. Our rights to keep and bear arms has never been under as much attack. And gun owners of America are fighting daily in Washington to protect that right. GOA is the only no-compromise gun lobby in Washington. The Gun Owners News Hour is hosted by GOA's Executive Director Larry Pratt. Be sure to join us next week. And remember, it's not just about gun control, it's about control. The Bill of Rights protects every American's God-given right to keep and bear arms. Now that right is being seriously undermined as legally registered rifles are being confiscated in some parts of our country. If we're not careful, we may find ourselves with no right to own guns. And that's where Gun Owners of America comes in. Gun Owners of America is in Washington every day fighting for you to keep that right. Congressman Ron Paul has called GOA the only no-compromise gun lobby in Washington. You need to be part of this great grassroots group of activists who are keeping the heat on their members of Congress. Find out right now how you can join. Call 888-886-GUNS and get started receiving their fact-filled newsletters and action alerts. Call 888-886-GUNS or go to their webpage at gunowners.org and help make your voice heard in Washington. Make that call right now and call Gun Owners of America at 888-886-GUNS. Remember, it's not just about gun control, it's about control.